Good morning and welcome. So lovely to be with you again with this online service from Green Lane Presbyterian Church at this very special time of the year of Christmas. We welcome particularly our normal church family members and those who become familiar as part of the visiting team who join with us Sunday by Sunday in various parts of our country and in other parts of the world. Uh, we want to greet you uh, warmly this morning. It's wonderful to be together. As my call to worship, I'm not going to choose a passage of scripture as I so often do, but these words, joy to the world, the Lord has come. Let earth receive her king. Let every heart prepare him room and heaven and nature sing and heaven and nature sing joy to the world the lord has come heavenly father there's a song of joy an anthem of praise in our hearts this morning as we gather to worship you thank you for this very unique time of the year where we can remember that you stepped down from heaven to earth to be humiliated as a baby that you might be the ultimate Saviour, we worship you. We pray that our focus would be on you today and over this time. Draw near to us, we pray. Amen. Well, just before I lead you in a time of prayer where we pray for our nation, our world, and those in need, uh, just a few basic notices to draw to your attention. This is our last um, online service that starts exactly at 930 Hereafter, they will continue to be on YouTube as we've done over the years. You'll be able to get the uh, message on Sunday afternoon or um, uh, Monday morning. Um, they will be on YouTube. There's about 200 messages on YouTube, so you'll be able to use any of those. But this is the last online service for this stage. We don't know how things will change as the new year uh, commences. We do encourage you to come back to church. Many people are coming back now and their Sunday school and church. In fact, we've got quite a heavy program uh, planned uh, on the 24th. If you're around, we've got a family service. It's going to be a great time to sing and hear from the word of God. The 25th is Christmas Day, a shortened service at 9.30 to sing and to honor our Christ. The next day is the 26th Sunday and uh, it comes around again. And uh, we're going to be having a special Thanksgiving service, a time to lift up our hearts in thanksgiving to God. And then on the 3rd uh, of January, the New Year's Challenge. So if you're around uh, in Auckland, uh, either visiting or part of our church family, come back to church. Be with us as we worship God together. We come now to a time of prayer. Let us pray. Lord, we worship you adore you, honour you, give you thanks as we contemplate this very important time of the year. Lord, we want to be amongst those wise people who elevate you, who bow the knee before you, who worship you and who honour you, putting you first above all things. At this time, Lord, we pray for our land and nation. We pray that at this Christmas time, there would be a great turning to you that people would be dissatisfied with materialism and the uncertainty of life and find in you hope for time and for eternity. Our hearts go out, particularly to those who find themselves in poverty, who find themselves in want and in need, those who've got to visit food banks or the city mission. We thank you for the many people who go out of their way to serve our communities at this time. Prosper them and those who support their mission, we pray. Lord, we realize that for some it's a blue Christmas. They've lost a loved one or been parted from loved ones, and so this Christmas for them is a lonely time. In your grace, compassion, and mercy, be close to those with special needs. Lord, as we gather as a particular church, we thank you that we're back in worship. And we pray that you'd bless our services. Lord, keep us safe from the COVID and help us, Lord, to be people of worship, that our community might see that Christ is on the very top of our agenda. 
be with us with our Christmas Eve, Christmas Day, Thanksgiving services. We pray, O oh Lord, that they would serve a real need and meet people and instruct people and cause us to be a worshipping community of God's people on earth. For those of our friends who are traveling, who are away on the road or playing on the water, give them journeying mercies. Keep them safe, Lord, we pray, that they would return with your hand upon them. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you that you are our God and you have given us the gift that keeps on giving, the Lord Jesus Christ. We worship you and praise you in his holy name. Amen. We'll now have the reading from God's word. It's the passage I'm going to be looking at as we continue our journey through Matthew's gospel. So do keep it open. Good morning. We read this morning from Matthew chapter 2, beginning at the first verse. Matthew chapter 2 from verse 1. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Christ was to be born. In Bethlehem, in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler who will be the shepherd of my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and make a careful search for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen in the east went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold and of incense and of myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. This is God's word. Call the message today, Fools and Wise Men. From time to time, I love to read a legal novel, a courtroom drama. Uh, I love the cut and thrust of the courtroom, especially the wise use of, use of powerful words and how sometimes the whole uh, case can swing on just a word or two used. I love that, that drama. But as I have read those books from time to time, uh, in amongst other Christian books that I read, um, I've come to see that you've got to pay very careful attention to the players especially those who are introduced at the commencement of the novel because they often play a strategic part throughout the novel. They show you who the good guys are and who the bad guys are. As we read the drama of the birth of the Lord Jesus, this great saga of history, we've got to keep in mind the main role players, and we're going to see some of them were fools and some of them were wise men. However, if, if I had, had scripted this, I would script it very differently to the way we find it in the Bible. I would have had Jesus born at the capital city. I would have had him in the lavish palace setting. I would have had him laying in a, a gold-crusted cradle wrapped in the finest silk money could buy. 
I would have had the best pediatricians uh, in the room there at the birth of Christ. I would have had a special wing set aside for him, the best of the best for Jesus. However, the way it's scripted in scripture is quite different. He was born in Bethlehem. And we must understand Bethlehem was a nowhere little town, a dot on the map towards Jerusalem. He was laying in a cattle fodder trough. He was, he was wrapped in one single cloth, a swaddling cloth. The onlookers weren't princes, but animals. It wasn't a pediatrician who delivered baby Jesus, but the callous hands of a hardened carpenter, Joseph. He was born to poverty, scarcity, and humility. What an amazing story for the King of Kings. Who then were the main players to the saga? There was a politician, Herod. There was a priest or priests. And then there were the princes or the wise men. I want us to look at these three main players in this great saga. The first one is the politician, Herod. We're introduced to him there in verse Three of our passage, if your Bible is open, in Matthew chapter 2 from verse 3. Then King Herod heard this, he was disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him. And then again in verse 7 there we see, Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time and the star that had appeared. So here we introduce to this man Herod or King Herod. He was a half-Jew. He was put in charge of Palestine and called the king of that area, the king of the Jews, because of the favor shown by the Roman government to his father. Um, and so uh, Herod uh, inherited that area and became king of the area. He was a hard man, shrewd, cunning, treacherous, and very, very vicious. He was despised and feared by all under his rule. He was called Herod the Great for many reasons. On one occasion, he showed particular favor to the people. They were starving because of a drought, and he sold some of his own possessions to feed them. So he tried to curry favor with them. But I suppose he was called Herod the Great because of his building. He was always building. He, he left a legacy of great buildings, wonderful roads, bridges, temples, both for the pagans and for the Jews. He, he built palaces, and he also built sports stadia. He, he did all this building to curry favor and to protect his position. In fact, he refurbished the great temple in Jerusalem that wasn't quite finished even in the adult life of Jesus. In fact, um, one of the great things that is credited to Herod is concrete. Isn't that interesting? that they think he was the first man who built with concrete. I've been to the Holy Land and been to Caesarea Philippi, or to Caesarea. Caesarea is on the coast. And um, what uh, Herod did was as a tribute to Caesar, thus Caesarea, as a tribute to Caesar, he built a most magnificent port with beautiful sort of walls that went out to the sea. Those walls were anchored on big blocks of concrete. He had discovered that you could take the ash of a volcano, mix it in with certain ways, and it would become hard. And so he was the first one to use a basic concrete. He was very insecure, and some of his buildings were palaces, beautiful palaces on the outskirts of Jerusalem. If he was um, ousted from power and had to make a quick runner, he could go to one of his palaces. I've been to two of them. And in fact, the one of them you might know is called Masada. Masada, high up on that hill, that's where he bought, built a palace, lest he needs to flee. He was so insecure. In fact, he was so insecure that at one stage he killed three of his own sons because he suspected them and his favorite wife. He had ten. He killed his favorite wife in suspicion that they were after his power. Now we can understand when the Bible says, when Herod heard this, he was disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him. Everybody knew that if Herod was threatened, 
heads would roll. The whole of Jerusalem was terrified because Herod was distressed about this new king. The worst thing these wise men could have done was to come to Herod and say, where's the king? Where's the new king? In fact, Herod, we know, didn't find baby Jesus, and therefore he kills all the children two years old and younger. It tells us something of this, this dreadful, treacherous man. He wanted to cling on to power. Could there be another king in his realm? No way. He had the power, the position, the praise, the pomp, the crown, the fame, the wealth. He was going to hold it whatever it cost. How sad. How sad that this man held onto his pomp, his power, and his rule, and he ignored the Christ born under his nose. And I wonder if there are many people like that today. They will cling to their power, their pomp, their praise, their money, their affluence, their affluence, all these things. They, they, will, they will hold on to them and they'll ignore the Christ. There are many people in Auckland who will do that. There may well be someone in your own home who would rather have the things that this world offers than the Christ the Bible says, what shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his soul? My friend, may I ask you, are you in a way having the spirit of Herod? You won't have this man rule over you. Who rules your life? Who calls the shots? Who sets the pace? For Herod, it was himself. He would have no challenge to his rulership. Oh, my dear friend, make sure that your heart is supple to Christ and that you've given him full ownership and rulership, lest you too are foolish like Herod. Secondly, the other players that I want to look at that are foolish are the priests. You see there again in verse 4 it says, when he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Christ would be born. And then they answer, but you, um, they answer, but you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judea, are by no means least among the rulers in Judea. For out of you will come a ruler who will be the shepherd of my people, Israel. These were not just run-of-the-mill priests. These were the top dogs. These were the main honchos. This was the executive group of the priests. You'll see there he calls together the chief priests and teachers of the law. We must understand that the temple was massive. There were literally hundreds of priests who served every day on roster systems. It was a very big organization, and may I add, a very profitable organization as well. And so their pockets were full of money heading up and guiding the affairs of the temple. Sadly, they seem to be more interested in propping up the work of the temple than seeking for the Christ. It's amazing, absolutely amazing to me, that when Herod asked them where the Christ was to be born, they didn't have to look it up. They didn't have to look it up because they already knew. Where is the Christ to be born? Oh, they're very quick down in Bethlehem. Just mark this, 10 kilometers down the road. They won't make that trip to see him. These wise men travel 1,000 to 1,500 kilometers to see him. But these stuck-up priests who are propping up their religious system wouldn't go. You see, they knew the facts without knowing the Savior. They knew without believing. They heard without believing. They read without believing. They understood without worshiping. There are many people like that today. You could ask many people in our great city, 
if they know the Christmas story, and probably they know parts of it, if not all of it. But probably they don't worship Christ. You see, they know without believing. They hear without believing. They read without believing. Oh, my dear friend, don't be foolish. Don't know the story without coming to know the Savior. Don't read without believing. The Bible says this, Romans chapter 10 from verse 10. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. And it's with your mouth that you profess faith and are saved. As the scripture says, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame. That belief is a belief that surrenders, that commits, that repents, that leans on Jesus exclusively. It's not a belief of the head, but a belief of the heart. Remember the answer of the apostles to the jailer in Acts 16. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your household. Oh, my dear friend, may I plead with you this Christmas time? Don't have the facts sorted out. Don't just read the story, but believe the Savior with all your heart. And when do you do it? Now. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. Don't put it off for a moment longer. Today is the day of salvation. 2 Corinthians 6 and verse 2. Oh, the fools. The fools were Herod, clinging on to power and missing the most powerful one. The priests clinging on to their, their beliefs and their religion, but missing Christ. But then there's a third group, the princes, the wise men. And this is the focus of our message today. We see these wise men. Now, there's a lot of um, tradition and speculation that has infiltrated the story. Uh, that is just not true. Uh, how many there were, we're not sure. Uh, how far they traveled, we do not know. Where they started their journey, we have no idea. How long they traveled to get to Jerusalem, how long they stayed in Jerusalem. When they departed, where did they go? How they got to know Christ originally. What mode of transport they used. How many of them? We just don't know these things. Oh, yes, tradition tells us there's three because there were three gifts. In fact, tradition has gone as far, <laughs> amazingly, as far as to even name them. Caspar, Melchor, and Belshazzar, they, they are, are traditionally known to be the, the, the long down the line of the sons of Noah, the three. they called three kings. We don't know these things. What is interesting is this, that there certainly just weren't three lone figures traveling on some camels through the desert. This was an entourage. I want to suggest, I believe on good authority, that it was a small army. For them to have traveled this vast distance and have brought such expensive gifts, no ways would they have traveled alone through the desert. They needed a whole bank of soldiers with them. And then they needed servants, and then they needed food, and they needed horses and animals. This was an entourage. This was a small army. That's why Herod was anxious when the small army arrives on his doorstep looking for a king. What do we know about them? Is that they came to the house where Jesus was. Did you note that? Not the stable, the house. This was some months after the birth of Christ. I know what our cards seem to suggest that around Mary are the shepherds and the wise men. No, no, no. Look carefully from there at verse 9. After they had after they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star that was seen in the east went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where Jesus lay. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming into the house, oikos. Not the stable, the house, not the lean-to and the shed, but they came to the house. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gold and with incense and of myrrh. Note they came looking for the child. I love that. 
they didn't make the assumptions I would have made. <laughs> uh, yes, I, I, I would have put it all so differently. They came looking for the child. And um, when they come, they worship him. Isn't that lovely? They fall, the, the, the Greek is, they fall on their faces, proschunio. It's, it's the word used to bury your face at the feet of someone. And will you note this? They buried their faces before they gave gifts. This is important. Before we give anything to Jesus, we come to him in worship. Before we try and serve him, we adore him. That's the way it works. They fell full on their faces. What a lovely example this was. Stuck away in the temple were the priests at the feet of Jesus were the wise men, the outsiders. Doesn't this tell us something? It tells us that the grace of God and the salvation of God is not for the religious only, not just for the covenant community, but for all people, for the foreigners, for the outsiders, not just for the children of Abraham, but for all who will seek him. The Bible says, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. The Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. What a lovely picture. Foreigners from the outside, unknown people, come and bow before him. You see, the Bible says, God wants all people everywhere to be saved and come to a knowledge of himself. For there's neither Jew nor Greek, male nor female, slave nor free. We're all one in Christ. Any person of any race, of any background, uh, of any gender, may seek the Lord and be found of him. We too need to fall at his feet this Christmas, whoever you are, whatever your background, rich or poor. I love the fact that the poor outcast shepherds came and worshipped. And then the next class were the affluent princes or kings. You see, Jesus is for everyone. But will you note in closing what they brought? They opened their gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. It's interesting, gold. Gold is mentioned about 380 times in the Bible, and it's always the symbol of kingship. Note how consistent that is. If you endured the sermon last week, you would have known that we looked at the genealogy. And remember that genealogy was in the line of the kings to show that Jesus was born in the line of the king. And now when they come to worship him, they worship him as king. Can you see Matthew has an agenda? We need to establish from chapter 1 to chapter 28, Jesus Christ is king. I think there's a an addition to this gold, and that is that the gold would have financed poor Mary and Joseph to go down to Egypt and hide Jesus for that period and then return. The gold was needed for the journey. God provides for his people adequately. Well, you note also, it was frankincense. Frankincense is used in the temple as a sweet aroma uh, in worship, and thus, they worship Jesus as one worships God. They, were, they fall before him and use incense as a sweet-smelling uh, aroma in worship. And then there's myrrh. Myrrh was used to mix with wine as a sedative to dull pain. Strange that they bring that to a baby. And furthermore, Myrrh was used in the embalming, embalming of a dead person. And so there's the symbol both of suffering and death. The gold for the king, the frankincense for the worship of God, and the myrrh for the death and the suffering of Christ. Deep, rich symbols for our learning. This Christmas, we too must fall at his feet. We too must worship him. We too must sing the song, take my life and let it be. Consecrated Lord to thee, take my moments and my days. Let them flow in ceaseless praise. Take my silver and my gold. Not a mite would I withhold. Let us be wise men and women and fall before the Lord Jesus in adoration 
and service. I heard of a statue in Europe. I'm not sure exactly where it is, but it's of Jesus. And the unusual thing is, Jesus is looking down. His head is cast down. And the only way to look into his face, which tourists often try and do, what you've got to do is get close to the statue, then get at the feet of the statue and look up. That's the only way you can see his face. This Christmas, my dear friend, that's what we need to do with Jesus. We need to get at his feet and look up in his face in humility and call him our Lord and our Savior. As we walk away from our passage, fools and wise men, we see Herod was a fool because he clung to his position and his rule and he failed to give the rule to Christ. We see that the religious leaders were fools because knowing and quoting the scripture was all they could do. They didn't believe. It's not enough to know. We must believe. Many will say to me on that day, says Jesus in Matthew 5, in Matthew 7, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, didn't we cast out demons in your name and do wonderful things? And he said, I never knew you. You've got to believe on him with your heart. But then there was the wise men. They searched for Jesus and wouldn't be put off. Herod didn't put them off. The religious leaders and their stubbornness wouldn't put them off. They searched until they found him. And when they found him in humility, they worshipped him. That should be our response if we're going to be wise today. I heard of a little boy at Christmas time when everybody was opening the presents and all the excitement. He stopped for a moment and in his innocency, he looked into his mother's face and said, Hey, mom. <laughs> Isn't Christmas the birthday of Jesus? Then where's his presence? The mother had nothing to say. You see, we too must give Jesus a present, not some plastic or tinsel, but the only legitimate present is to give him our lives, to surrender all to him, to do what the wise men did, to bow low and give him our best. Let us bow in prayer. Lord, as we've seen the saga of the birth of our Lord Jesus, and we see the foolish people deliver us from that category, help us to be wise and fall at your feet in worship. We pray that we would so love you and be such examples for you this Christmas time that others we meet might see our love for you and they too would move from foolishness to faith, from doubt to worship. We commit ourselves to you and thank you for this wonderful time of the year. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, dear friends, um, for those of you part of our family, you're welcome to jump onto Zoom and meet with a few people. Um, as we uh, have that Zoom meeting and uh, do remember our whole Christmas program. It'll be lovely to see you back in church. Remember, this is the last online. Hereafter, there'll be just YouTube and uh, you're welcome to be part of that. May God bless you and your family over this Christmas time.